the tabernacle in the wilderness. What can we learn from this? Well, there are definitely a number of things we can learn about when we look at the tabernacle in the wilderness. Greetings, I'm David Brett, here with John Fisher bringing you Revealing the Truth. And today we'll want to look at a number of aspects of this tabernacle, and this is actually a, a copy or an image from the heavenly uh, as we look at in, in the book of Hebrews. But we'll want to consider the altar of incense, the bronze basin, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, altar of burnt offering, the, the golden lampstand, and see how uh, some of these things relate uh, to other areas of Scripture and, and what we can learn. Um, the tabernacle itself uh, I think is considered fairly small compared to what we would get into say during Ezekiel's time in the uh, millennial reign. When you go into Ezekiel 40 through 46, we can gain some insight uh, there. I don't know if we'll have time to get into that, but uh, we definitely want to look at this area where the uh, parts of and the, the materials for the taber tabernacle, all these instructions are basically given uh, starting in Exodus chapter 25 after the um, covenant was ratified, uh, going over the civil law for Israel, uh, and then, of course, the Ten Commandments. And just to review, I mean, there are a number of things coming into the first covenant, which we see. Uh, Levitical priesthood, which had the ceremonial washings, uh, sacrifices. You also have uh, civil law for Israel, which we're under a different civil law today. So those aspects, uh, Levitical priesthood, the civil law, that's not really for us in the Messiah, in the New Covenant, in this society. But we still obey the civil law. Uh, Revelation 13, uh, I think uh, Peter also relates that we are to be honoring the King, both of the land and, and uh, of course, our Heavenly Father. Ultimately, the civil law is going to be brought back into play uh, when we get into the millennial rule. And there's going to be a physical people there. There's also going to be the Levit Levitical priesthood there. All this is coming. And it, uh, we, we see all of this uh, established from the beginning. Even the Levitical priesthood, we see the sacrifices being done not through Levitical priesthood, but through um, the need of a law added for the sins of the people, specifically Adam and Eve, who first sinned and animals had to die for them. And that process went through uh, even with Noah, um, you know, and uh, Abram, who before he was called Abraham, uh, made sacrifices to Yahweh and he knew his name and he offered sacrifices which he knew uh, should be offered. And even he, Cain he and knew Abel. the law of Yahweh. That's right. Uh, Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5. I mean, he's often known about his faith. Well, why was he faithful? Well, because he was obedient. Um, it it, it uh, works together. But when we go into Exodus chapter 25, and I should uh, conclude that there is the eternal law. What was Abram aware of? He was aware of Yahweh's eternal laws, statutes, judgments, commandments, and all these uh, get put in and condensed, I think, in the Ten Commandments. Uh, a number of things um, that the Messiah brought out come directly from uh, the, the scriptures as we would read from Genesis to, to Malachi. Um, but you know, we, f we find that there's an understanding to be had by looking at the different laws. There's not just, um, you know, different, uh, well, there's not just uh, the Ten Commandments. There's other laws, civil, Levitical, uh, that we would, even laws going into the land, that, that, you know, um, laws of thievery, even laws of slavery, um, which, you know, is understood, uh, I think, uh, to be when someone couldn't pay a debt, they would offer themselves up as a, a servant to the person that 
the money was owed. Um, so, but that's another, another uh, study. Exodus chapter 25, we get into the institution of the tabernacle, the materials needed for it. It says, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man whose heart moves him. You shall raise my contribution. And then it talks about the contribution of gold and silver and bronze. And all of this was to be worked into the tabernacle um, uh, furniture and, and, and um, you know, pans and, and lavers and all, all that. In verse 4 it mentions blue, purple, scarlet material. Well, if we look at the blue, that's uh, like heavenly. Um, you know, we can think of that. Purple uh, would be royalty. Um, scarlet, I think we see, you know, blood involved. And we see, even in Messiah, these colors. I mean, he's from heaven. He's He's royalty. Uh, you know, he's our king. Uh, he shed his blood for us. So as we go through, we can see a number of things that relate to the Messiah. Uh, and we can get insight uh, when we do that and consider that. It talks about ram's skins dyed red. And, and well, here it says porpoise skins. Uh, <laughs> when you look at the word to kach, uh, Strong's 8476. Some other alternatives are given for that word uh, because porpoise would be an unclean. It's not, you know, when you read through Le, um, Deuteronomy 14, Leviticus chapter 11, you see clean, unclean um, meats, animals, fish. Fish have to have uh, sc scales and fins, and porpoises don't have the scales. Uh, they do have the fence. So that would be an unclean thing. Why would that be implemented for the, the tabernacle? Well, the reality is it wouldn't be. So an antelope might be a possibility. Sheep, uh, English standard version gives sheep, uh, sheep skins as an alternative. And I think that's probably more accurate than certainly porpoise skins. So I think some even mentioned badger, maybe the King yeah, James. Yeah, the King James says. So a uh, badger would be an unclean animal. That wouldn't be used. Even Noah, uh, when the, you know, the clean, the unclean, that was known before Deuteronomy, before Leviticus, you know, going into the ark, it was known. Um, so that gives some ideas of, you know, well, did they eat clean before then? Because it talks about in Genesis, a time when just the green leaves and, and the seed and, and all that was given for food. But then later, uh, after the flood, every animal, you know, which would be clean, would be given for food. Um, some translations, like the New Living Translation, include the word ceremonial in the Deuteronomy 14, I think also in Leviticus 11. That's kind of misleading because yeah, I mean, we're physical. Those laws apply to us still today. Um, so we have to consider some of these things and not just spiritualize them away or just say, well, that was Levitical uh, priesthood stuff. We don't do that. Well, it's true. There's only one immersion for us. Uh, there's only one name under heaven for us. There's only uh, one shed blood for us, and that's through the Messiah. So under the Melchizedek order, we are under a different priesthood. And so there's a little bit of a change for us, amendments uh, for us. And uh, we see even Yahweh uh, adjusting things, um, you know, not only the food, but uh, in Numbers chapter 27, I think it is. I mean, no, Moses was often uh, sought out to answer questions. Well, the questions that he couldn't answer, he would go to Yahweh. Here's one of them. Uh, Numbers chapter 27, verse 1. Then the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hephar, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, came near. And these are the names of the daughters, Mala, Noah, Ahogla, Milcah, and Tirzah. Verse 2, it says, They stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the leaders of all the congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, yet he was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against Yahweh in the company of Korah, but he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. 
why should the name of our father be withdrawn from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before Yahweh, and then Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, the daughters have spoken correctly. <laughs> So there's, you know, there's adjustments because typically it was only uh, through the sons that the inheritance would be. But here's the daughters. There's no sons. Father's dead. Where's the inheritance? Don't we get something or can't we get something? And Yahweh conceded, yes, you can. So there's some adjustments that can be made. Um, in Exodus, um, going further through here, it's interesting to look at some of the uh, aspects of the law concerning the, the tabernacle and the furniture. Here it says, you shall put poles in the rings of the side of the ark. Now this is speaking of the Ark of the Covenant, and this is Exodus 25, 14. When we read in other areas of Scripture, for example, Judges chapter 6, and I'm, I'm sorry, let's go into 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6. And it says, um, 2 Samuel 6, verse 6, it says, When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out towards the ark of Elohim and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. Well, I think we know the story of this. I mean, Joshua... Uh, I should say Yahweh got angry at Uzzah for touching the ark and actually killed him. And we think of why he may have done that. You know, King David was uh, a, a bit upset that Yahweh would take his life. But there were sp specific reasons why that was evidently done. Now that ark was carried on a cart when you back up into that, that uh, previous verse talks about being carried on a cart. Well, that's not the instruction that Yahweh gave Israel. So it's very important that we pay attention to the instructions. The instructions were, you shall put holes in the, in the rings on the side of the ark to carry the ark. Uh, it says the pole shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. So the, the poles were evidently already removed. And here we have a, a situation which the law wasn't followed uh, properly and someone died because of it. And you have other situations in which this occurred. Uh, David counted Israel and the punishment was 70,000 died. Now what was the sin though? Well it was evidently David's pride and reliance on his army rather than on Yahweh. So there's some different things to consider and look at when we uh, go through Yahweh's word. How important is it to, for us to pay attention and to consider the details that are in this word? Uh, we find through Exodus, we, we, we find the table of bread, we find the lampstand, the curtains, uh, the boards, the veils, the bronze altar. A number of these things we'll, we'll look at when we come back because they are important to consider and look at when we think of the Messiah. In fact, the altar or the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, for example, had a mercy seat on it. What did those that looked into Yahshua's tomb see? They saw two angels standing on each end. And I think we see a representation of the mercy seat there. The appointed times or feasts of Leviticus chapter 23 were kept in the Old Testament, were kept in the New, and will be kept in the coming kingdom. The question is, why would we not keep them now? To learn more, request your free in-depth study entitled Biblical Holy Days. Write to YAIY 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri 65262 or visit online at yaiy.org. You may also call toll free 1877 642 4101.
Well, it's amazing how much time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> uh, as we go through this, I'm realizing we're probably not going to be able to spend as much time as I, I would like on each um, aspect or furniture parts of the tabernacle. As an overall view, I found this image, uh, which is given through the Logos Bible software, a graphic by Carbell um, Multimedia. And I think this uh, tabernacle is a good representation, though I don't agree with the slaughter tables. Because I think when you get into Leviticus, it talks about how the, the animals were to be slaughtered. And those tables, I don't think, are in the appropriate uh, locations. But you go further into this area that's covered with the blue and the, the scarlet and the uh, most likely goat skins. Um, that is where the Holy of Holies is, uh, the area where the showbread would be, the uh, menorah and the altar of incense, uh, which was covered in gold. Uh, the menorah itself was gold, and uh, we read of that here in Exodus 25 and verse 31. But just before this, we, we hear or uh, read of the bread of the presence, and it's on the table before Yahweh at all times. Well, those were uh, representative of the 12 tribes of Israel, we believe. So there are some representations that are not just about the Messiah, though the Messiah is concerned about uh, all of Israel. In fact, when you look at the breastplate on the high priest, you see uh, the 12 tribes uh, close and dear to his heart. Uh, of course, we, we find this was, was the high priest under the Levitical priesthood, Aaron. And um, through the Melchizedek order, though, we see um, Yahshua is our high priest and having the 12 tribes close to him. And ultimately this is going to be carried out uh, in fulfillment uh, in the uh, in, end of the age and, and uh, into eternity. But the lampstand is mentioned in verse 31 of Exodus 25. It says, Then you shall make a gold lampstand, lampstand of pure gold, the lampstand and its base, and a shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be of one piece uh, for you, uh, or uh, with it. And here we find in Jerusalem an image of a menorah that they think may be uh, close to what would be in the um, in the uh, ta uh, temple, and it's seven-tiered. Seven has a meaning of perfection and completeness, and we find Messiah is a perfect representation of this menorah. That is, uh, he is the light, and this shines forth the light in the, in the temple. Um, ultimately, you find Yahweh and Yahshua in Revelation, I think, 21, being the uh, lamp and, and the, the temple itself and uh, you know no need of um, the sun or the moon anymore. Uh, it's going to be quite remarkable what, what is coming. But we find that the, the this menorah uh, is often called candlestick holder but it's you know it's for oil and there's approximately from what I understand about eight ounces of oil that can be held in each stem or each bowl that's on each stem and uh, that would last about 15 hours from what research I could find on it now they were to switch out uh, trim the lamps and, and these type of things at different times. When we look at those times, it's interesting because uh, in Exodus uh, 30 and verse 7, it says, Aaron shall burn fragrance. So the incense was to be put on the uh, altar of incense uh, at these times as well. But it says, every morning, every bokur, uh, that's uh, after the sun rises, when he trims the lamps, um, an olive oil would have been used for that. Uh, not just any olive oil, but uh, properly processed oil that would produce less smoke because it's actually in the temper, uh, temple area, uh, kind of enclosed. But it says in verse 9, it says, You shall not offer any strange incense on this altar. Um, speaking of the altar of incense, burnt offering or meal offering, you shall not pour out a drink offering on it. 
Aaron uh, show. Oh, let me back up. I actually bypassed the verse uh, which has this word twilight in it in this translation. It says, when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be a perpetual incense before Yahweh throughout your generations. And the menorah was to be lit continually. Well, uh, everything fits. When we look at the twilight here, it's the wording bin ha arbim. Now, there's words that we have to consider. A reb, which is the sun heading down towards sunset. Bo, which is the sun setting below the horizon. And then this time period of bin ha arbim can last upwards of an hour and a half, where there's light to be seen still, but the sun has let, uh, gone down below the horizon. So when we're looking at the timing here, it's really perfection that we're looking at because it's a 12-hour period uh, in which this process would take place. So I was very happy to see confirmation when I looked into, you know, how long eight ounces of oil would last. Well, up to 15 hours, so that would be plenty of time for this process to take place. So just interesting, and, and you know, when we look at things like Exodus 29, verse 20, the high priest and the priest sons, the Levites, it says, you shall slaughter the lamb and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the lobes of his sons. Uh, right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet and sprinkle the rest of the blood around the altar. Why would, that's kind of strange, why, w why would they do that? Well this was Yahweh's instructions and it's evidently some insight for us that can be gleaned here. I mean when we think about our accepting of Yahshua's blood, we are to pay attention to what we hear. We are to be careful what we put our hand forth to grab hold of. We are to be careful in how we walk. You know, Yahshua never sinned. We are not to sin either, so we have to keep our steps in line with His. And uh, he says in, in John, you know, basically, as I've kept my Father's commandments, you know, keep mine and you'll, you'll be in our love. And this is what he wanted, uh, you know, with the, that was his prayer to the Father even in John chapter 17. And this gives us insight also as to why the laver, here's an image of a mock-up of a tabernacle that's in southern Israel. This is in a park, I think, uh, in the city of Timna, uh, if I'm not mistaken. This is actually owned by the Southern Baptist, but you, you'll see that uh, the, the uh, altar is there where they would burn sacrifices, the horns of the altar there on each corner. And then the, the, uh, the laver, the bronze laver, well that had water in it. Why would there be water in it? What was the purpose of the water? Well, we can relate our cleansing through the Messiah with this water. But we can also see why it was used. If there's blood on the feet, if there's blood on the hands through the sacrifices, they were to wash their hands. They were to wash their feet before they would proceed anywhere near the tabernacle or the, the tent of meeting, the actual temple part. And we can consider that and this actually is the first temple. We, we hear of Solomon being the first temple. Well, technically, this one, and if you go back to the temple in heaven, you know, we could look at that as the first one. Mm -hmm. So there's different ways of looking at what would be the first temple, the second temple. But we have Zerubbabel after Solomon. We have uh, Herod uh, rebuilding over that area. We have different temple sizes. Uh, this image was something put out by Logos in which it shows Herod's temple, the size of it. It shows Solomon's temple below on the right there. And then the court of the tabernacle, which actually had the, the temple within it as we're looking at this wilderness uh, tabernacle. And that shows the American football field at the bottom. Now Ezekiel's temple, it shows on the, le on the left here, and it's something like uh, 750 feet by 750 feet. Well, E.W. Bullinger in his appendix indicates that this is wrong, that the temple in Ezekiel that's mentioned for the uh, coming kingdom, the millennial rule, is going to be much greater in size and scope than many of us realize. Now, I know scholars have looked at the numbers and they just couldn't believe that <laughs> the Ezekiel temple would be something like, you know, a mile squared. 
I mean, that's what uh, Bollinger is bringing out. Now, he was a, a Hebrew scholar of sorts, a language expert, but he looked at the at what was given, and the the numbers literally relate something like 5,200, you know, for, uh, for a mile mm -hmm. of footage there. Now, it gets much bigger than that. You have to understand the, the Levitical priesthood area, the, the other areas, uh, even the city of Jerusalem is going to be 12 miles squared, but the overall area is 60 miles squared. And when we think of Joshua coming back, landing his, you know, putting his feet on the Mount of Olives, and that separating, and a great valley being created, there's going to be a lot more room in Jerusalem than I think many people realize. And why would that be? Well, when you look at, um, I think it's Zechariah chapter 14, is it where it, uh, or is it Ezekiel 14? I think it's Zechariah 14. Let's take a look. Um, no, Ezekiel 14, I think. Let me, let me take a quick look. But it talks, uh, it must be Zechariah. Uh, it talks about um, what? It talks about the feast of Yahweh being kept in the kingdom. It talks about even Egypt. Now we hear about, oh, these laws were for Israel only. Well, Yahweh says, uh, not only for Israel, but for the foreigner that joins, uh, it's one law for everyone uh, in Exodus chapter 12. But when we look at Zechariah chapter 18, for example, or chapter 14, verse 18, it says, if the family of Egypt, if even Egypt, and we know that Moab and, and other uh, nations will be in the kingdom, but it says, if the family of Egypt even does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague which Yahweh smites the nations who do not come up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This is important. I mean, have your ministers even told you about things like this? This is what's coming. And this is why when we look at Scripture and we see the, the feast days being done previously, being done in the New Testament, being done in the coming kingdom, why would we not keep them now? These are questions that we have to ask ourselves. But the temple and the overall area in Jerusalem is going to be quite large in size. And so the animals that will be sacrificed under the Levitical priesthood for the physical people will be done. We understand that we hope to be there as spiritual people, uh, helping rule with Yahshua. Uh, when you read Revelation 2 and 3, there's rulership that's even granted um, for those that overcome. And we're, we're essentially going through rehearsals, uh, keeping these days, in Leviticus chapter 23, for example, these days are said to be holy convocations forever. They don't stop. It's a continuous a process and Yahweh wants his people to be in line with his word. What the tabernacle shows us is not only for Messiah but is for Israel and all who will join.